were affected by racism and xenophobia. For all people of color, the shootings and violence of the past week is nothing new, but a part of a long, ugly history in the U.S. The life of Chin Lin Fu is set in the exclusion era. As you will learn, Chin Lin Fu often challenged Western perceptions of Chinese people. Today, I hope that you not only enjoy hearing about Fu's accomplishments and learning about the parallels, but you learn about the perils of his life to our modern times. Learning the history of the exclusion era is vital for understanding the contemporary impacts of what our community is facing today. Sharing this history is equally important, especially for those individuals who are not people of color. I hope that wherever you are today, you are well and safe. Our presenter today is Samuel Porteous. He's an award-winning Shanghai-based artist and author with 20 years of experience living and working in China. He is the chief creative officer and founder of Drowsy Emperor Studio, a small Hong Kong or Shanghai based boutique design and content studio serving Chinese and Western audiences. He's also an artist in residence at Shanghai's Tang Yong Gardens. Sam's work, which includes visual arts, illustrations, film, and more, focuses on China and Western perceptions. Thank you and welcome, Sam. Hi, Maggie. Should I share my screen? Yes, go ahead. The show is yours. Okay, let me do that. Let's take that. Thanks, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to speak to everyone today. And I echo what you said about recent events and the importance of understanding, uh, improving understanding and bridge be building between peoples. So I think that uh, today's topic, uh, Ching Ling Fu, in many ways speaks to that. Uh, the biography uh, that I wrote of Fu really looks at trying to give back to Fu some of the recognition that he's long been deferred and that he deserves so richly. It is a, um, the Fu story is a magical one, as I indicate here, and it, it contains so many elements that echo our current time. Uh, the conflict between Chinese and Western culture, geopolitical tensions, international intrigue, the importance of celebrity, uh, even disruptive technological developments. Fu was a pioneer in so many of these that I think you know, we will see strong echoes with our current era. Um, looking at um, his remarkable range of accomplishments, it's important to recognize that Fu was not just a magician. And it's also important to recognize that the past is never over. Looking at his achievements, I want to run through these at the start before we go into detail about his life and um, the environment in which he achieved these things. So you have at the back of your mind an idea of just what this man was able to accomplish in the environment he was operating in. Uh, surprisingly for many people, Fu was uh, the highest paid and most popular performer uh, between 1898 and 1900, and again between 1912 and 1915 in the United States. He was making uh, the present uh, amount of approximately 32,000 US dollars to $56,000 a week. And in addition, he would have had a percentage of the gate and he would have traveled in the uh, private jet equivalent of the time, which was a uh, railway car, a private railway car, which is a bit ironic given um, the work that many of his compatriots had done in building those. He also inspired a mania for Chinese magic. Chinese magic, of course, had existed for a long time. But for the American audience, it was Fu who became the iconic Chinese magician and inspired much of that mania for Chinese magic that lasted well into the uh, 1950s and beyond. Another element that is very topical from Fu's uh, list of achievements is his success in uh, his deportation trial. There was a major deportation trial involving Fu that was covered across the country. Major headlines, it was one of the many trials of the century. Uh, Fu also on the technological side, the list of what he did is remarkable. He made the first recordings of Chinese music and singing uh, in 1899. 
And for the magic historians who are listening, uh, and many people come to Fu through magic history, he is largely known as the competitor or great rival of Chung Ling Su, the yellow face performer, William Robinson, and their great competition, uh, the World Championship of Chinese Magic in London in 1905. Fu's achievements continue um, on the technological side. He, he had an enormous impact on the development of film. Um, we'll talk more about that later, but just to, to highlight, he made the first Chinese film documentary. And not only was it the first Chinese film documentary, it was also a very important film. And we'll talk about that when we come to that section. Fu's achievements continue. Um, during his second tour, he played a significant role in busting the United Booking Office monopoly. And uh, we won't get into great detail on that in this talk, but again, this was a significant achievement and he was dealing with some pretty rough characters. Um, then in the second tour in 1913, Fu headlined the Ziegfeld Follies. Those who are familiar with entertainment history will know how important the Ziegfeld Follies were and what a coup it would be to headline those Follies. Back again to technological disruption and film, there's a very strong argument to be made that Fu is in fact the grandfather of film special effects. And we will get into detail on that later. Um, and perhaps most importantly, uh, you'll see in the discussion of Fu and his time in the US, uh, Fu provided a very impactful and different picture, what was termed a different picture of the Chinese to an American public that had been uh, used to an environment wherein certainly in popular entertainment, depictions of the Chinese tended to be quite negative. Now let's take a look here at um, where Fu grew up and where he came from. Fu was born in 1854 in Tianjin or what is now known as Tianjin, which a major port city about 70 miles from Beijing. That is why in some instances, people refer to it as a suburb of Beijing, not really, but in the history, uh, sometimes Fu is uh, described as being born in Beijing. So that's where that uh, comes up. You can see from this map, I just wanted to give you an idea of how uh, cosmopolitan the environment was that Fu would have grown up in. You can see the different colors on that map. Those different colors, and I'm just gonna see if I can move this bar, which uh, I can't, so I will not do that. But those colors reflect different national concessions. What the concessions were, were the territories that foreign powers were given power over, had legal authority over in various port cities across China. Where Fu grew up, you saw that there, were, there was a Russian concession, a French concession, uh, Austro-Hungarian, Italian. There was a wide range of different countries that had uh, legal authority over various pieces of Chinese territory. So this made Tianjin at once uh, both cosmopolitan and also uh, a tableau of sort of the frictions between the West and China at that time. Now, again, with Fu's early days, um, when Fu was a young child, uh, probably around nine years old or so, what has been said is that his father died. And around that time, young Fu would have developed a stutter. Now, this speech impediment uh, might have led him to focus on magic and his style of presentation in magic. As a boy growing up in Tianjin, uh, which would have been a fascinating place at that time, he was fascinated uh, by the treaty port street magicians and card sharp gamblers. So he would watch very carefully the, how the gamblers played cards, the tricks they played, and the street magicians, which were very numerous at that time. Again, um, similar to many uh, people who overcame adversity, uh, Fu had a childhood illness. And this illness apparently left him bedridden for some time. And he used that time to hone his magic skills. So by Fu's account, um, his friends would come to visit him and he would be bedridden, but he would want to entertain them. 
So he would work on um, hand manipulation magic, making things disappear out of his hands and learning the skills that he would need later in life. As he got older, um, early teenage years, reportedly one of the stories is he joined a Tianjin Society of Magicians, which he would have been with for approximately five years. And then after he'd learned his trade, he toured Asia um, and performed before foreign audiences and uh, Chinese audiences. And having what he believed mastered his trade, he returned to Beijing and matched his skills against the best magicians in Beijing and reportedly came out quite well in the contest. Now, what we know, so what I just told you is what has been said and what Fu has said. What I'm saying now is what we know from documentation. What we know from documentation, and a lot of this comes from the trial, the archival records of Fu's deportation trial. So that's one thing we have to thank the trial for, is that it created this tangible record of Fu's past to a certain extent. What happened in 1880 was that Fu, um, as a young man, joined the Yuan Lung trading firm, which had offices in Beijing, San Francisco, um, and Shanghai, and of course Tianjin. And so this reflects one element of Fu's career. Of course, Fu's real name is Julian Kui, I should have said that. His stage name was Qingling Fu. Uh, and he'd adopted that stage name uh, for many, many years before he came to the US. And uh, Qingling Fu has uh, associations with gold and uh, happiness and riches and things like that. So it was a pleasing, a pleasing name to hear uh, in the Chinese language. So Fu joins the Yuan Lung trading firm, and it reflects this mix of the magic and the mercantile in his career. Fu, throughout his career, mixed business and magic. He was a very good businessman, and uh, he was also a very good magician. In the 1880s and 90s, before he came to America for the first time, Fu was already a major star in Asia. So he performed uh, before mixed audiences. He performed on the ships, the many ships that came into uh, port uh, in China uh, for the foreign audiences, mixed audiences in the treaty ports and before Chinese audiences. And the important thing about Fu was even before a Chinese audience performing Chinese magic, he was considered exceptional. Even in Asia, he was considered to have given what were considered wearily familiar illusions, some of the production tricks and other things, a new glow. So he had that talent, uh, even before a Chinese audience. And his patrons uh, included, we know, uh, the British governors of Hong Kong and Singapore, and reportedly the uh, Chinese royal family. So this takes us to Fu's first tour of the US. Fu is going to be in the Omaha World's Fair in 1898. What was the Omaha World's Fair? Well, it was the World's Fair Exposition. It was designed to promote the opening of the US West and the emergence of the US as a world power. A lot of things were happening in 1898. The actual exposition began when President McKinley pressed a button in Washington and illuminated this wonderful lagoon surrounded by a white city that rivaled the white city that had been created for the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. These buildings you see in this photograph were actually created by hemp and plaster of Paris. They were very solid, but they were not meant to last. They also uh, demonstrated electricity, which was new to many of the people. There's somewhat uh, 2.6, almost 3 million people who would have come to see the fair at that time. Now the Chinese, as they had in 1893, the Chinese government did not participate as a government in the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. They didn't participate as a government in the 1898 World's Fair either. 
That was arguably, some say, partially in response to the Exclusion Act and their uh, objections to the US uh, having enacted the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. But Chinese businessmen already present in America who had seen, um, who had uh, created a pavilion uh, in Chicago in 1893 also looked at Omaha as an opportunity both to introduce Chinese culture and perhaps uh, make a profit at the same time. Um, you have um, Hip Lung, who was the Chicago businessman who had been involved in the Chicago uh, Fair. And you have uh, Treasury Secretary Lyman Gage, who were key people in getting the Chinese vi village created for the Omaha World's Fair. Where Gage came in is you needed a special act of con uh, Congress to authorize the entry of approximately 250 Chinese people who would be operating and acting uh, in various capacities in the proposed Chinese village in the fair. Now the Chinese village um, was quite a, was quite a uh, production. There was over 250 uh, staff as we'd indicated and it was located on the midway because it wasn't an official country exhibit. And it was across, as you can see in the photo, from the Pabst Pavilion and uh, the cyclorama, which was a new technology. And that cyclorama was talking uh, and giving demonstrations of things that had happened in the Civil War. The Chinese Pavilion, you can see right here, the Chinese village, if you can see my pointer. Um, you entered through a large gate, which was festooned with both American and Chinese flags. <clears throat> and you came across a theater, a tea house. Um, essentially, they tried to recreate a Chinese city in miniature. Now, they somewhat optimistically uh, referred to these recreations. You can see some images here in the photos as exact reproductions of those used in the city of Peking. But uh, they weren't quite exact reproductions, but they were created by Chinese artisans who had come to build these buildings from China. Now, pretty quickly, um, Fu became the star of not only the uh, Chinese theater and the Chinese village, he became the standout performer for the Omaha Exposition. And what was the Fu performance like? Um, it was a variety act. So what you had was a number of different performers, something like the Cirque Soleil today, if you can think of it that way. In fact, the Cirque Soleil borrows heavily from uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese circuses and things like that. So what Fu's act would include would, of course, be Fu's magic, which included, you know, your traditional Chinese production illusions where a, you would have a blanket or cloth laying on the floor, it would be ripped up rapidly and things would appear that had not been there before from underneath the, the blanket or carpet. Um, also, or shawl. Uh, also, you had um, decapitation. You see the illustration there. That is a recreation of what these advertisements looked like at that time. And uh, essentially what the decapitation illusion, which was quite a hit included, would be that a, a young, um, one of his young assistants would lie down and Fu would seemingly with a large ax or sword separate their head from their shoulders. And um, that would continue for some time. And then Fu would stop the blood. He would reattach the head to the shoulders and the young assistant would get up and walk off the stage no worse for wear. Um, he also did a fire breathing act, which was, uh, from all reports, quite exceptional. And he would spit fireballs from his mouth. So it wasn't simply fire. These were large uh, balls of fire, which would become larger with each, each effort and um, was something that people felt was quite spectacular. This would be a comp accompanied by him emitting a very thick and fragrant black smoke that would fill the entire uh, audience. And uh, finally, uh, paper tearing. And this was a, this was a trick that uh, American magicians adopted, Fu's paper tearing trick, where he would tear up 
paper and then seemingly put it back together again. Uh, also on the Foo Variety Act, you would see acrobats, jugglers, and there was a very popular um, juggler who worked with Foo, and his name was Harry Foo, and he would juggle large Chinese vases that weighed up to 40, 60 pounds. He would toss them into the air, catch them spinning on his forehead or on his fists, and he would uh, entertain people by singing uh, portions of uh, English songs while he did that. Then there were the traditional slack wire performers, a horizontal bar performer, and contortionists. Uh, and Fu's also on stage, very importantly, and something that had a lot to do with Fu's appeal was his family was also on the stage. And this was something that was very rare for exclusion era America was to see, you know, a Chinese family uh, because of the laws of the time. So seeing a uh, Chinese woman and her children uh, performing with their uh, husband uh, and father was something that was quite uh, unusual for the audiences at that time. Now, so as we say, this is the exterior of the Chinese village. Uh, tremendously popular. They said at the time it was like a small city because so many people were pressing into the village uh, and visiting it and seeing all the various things to be seen and primarily lining up and getting a chance to see Fu's performance. One thing I point out from this illustration, which comes from us, is that apart from the period uh, accurate uh, clothing, if you see what the woman is carrying here, just above the signature, that is a carrying case for a handheld camera. So in 1898, it's interesting to note that um, Kodak created the first handheld cameras. And it was at the Omaha World's Fair, uh, the first time that a World's Fair had to deal with people walking around with handheld cameras. And again, technological disruption um, the fair managers had to negotiate with the uh, studio portrait uh, photo companies that had already negotiated licenses with them for providing exclusive photos of the fair because you had all these people wandering around with their own handheld cameras. And they developed a licensing system where people had to pay a dollar and get a ticket and they would attach the ticket to their camera and then they would be allowed to wander the fair and take pictures with their new camera. Here's the happy family, uh, the hit of the fair. Fu was described as this wonderful man. And everyone who was reporting on the Omaha World's Fair said, what you have to see is you have to see the Fu Troop. And in fact, the Fu Troop was not only popular at the fair, they were exceptionally popular in Omaha with the people of Omaha. And the society matrons at the time of Omaha competed for the downtime of the Fu family. And people would be, um, it was a rare dinner invitation to be able to sit down at a gathering with Fu and his wife and several of the good and great of Omaha and enjoy a meal and conversation together. And often several Chinese friends would join them at these dinners. So again, the people-to-people -people diplomacy for Fu continued even beyond the fairgrounds. Now, looking at how popular Fu was and how successful their act was, it's good to take a step back and say, well, how were Chinese people generally presented in American popular media prior to Fu's appearance at the Omaha World's Fair? Well, an interesting place to start with that is the, um, is the uh, heathen Chinese or plain language from Truthful James, which was written in 1870 by Bret Hart. Why this poem is so important is it became the most popular uh, poem in the English speaking world. And what was the subject of this poem? The subject of this poem was a card game between two European Americans and a Chinese. And the storyline is this, um, the two European Americans set out to cheat the Chinese uh, man. And they had invited him to play a game of whist, which was a gambling game at that time. 
the Chinese man, whose name was A ah Sin, professed not to understand how to play the game. The two European Americans encouraged him and they said, we will teach you, we'll show you how to play the game. So he consented and he started playing cards with them as you can see in the illustration. What happened next was uh, the Chinese man was winning and he was winning the card game. And which was strange because the two European Americans had set up a system where they were going to cheat him. So the European American um, who represented the working class at that time in this satirical poem, leapt up from his table. And remember, this is 1870. And he shouts, we are ruined by cheap Chinese labor. You can see it highlighted here in the poem. And he struggled. He grabbed the Chinese, Asin, and Asin and the working man struggled. And as they struggled, Asin's large sleeves flew open and all these cards came tumbling out of Asin's sleeves. So in fact, what had occurred was that Asin had in fact cheated them when in fact they were trying to cheat him. So what was the conclusion? The conclusion was down here at the bottom highlighted that for ways that are dark and for tricks that are vain, the heathen Chinese is peculiar. Now, this, as I mentioned, became the most popular poem in the English speaking world, not just in the US, but also in London. So Bret Hart was sort of a precursor to Mark Twain and in fact would work with Mark Twain. But this poem was his most popular piece of work. It was intended as a satire, but people took it um, as, as something, as a message and a warning. And that phrase that for ways that are dark and for tricks that are vain, the heathen Chinese is peculiar, basically saying the Chinese are too clever, they're too tricky, you try to cheat them, they end up cheating you. That became repeated almost every place that Fu would perform. The journalists would, this would be the opening line of uh, seven out of 10 reports on Fu. And it reflected some of the early tropes of the, uh, at that time, because most people in America, when this was the most popular poem, had never met a Chinese person. This was their introduction to the Chinese, this poem. And it also was one of the early examples of um, commercialization. This, this was put on, this poem was put on plates. It was put, this is the Rock Island uh, Railway uh, route information that was used. They, they used it for their uh, schedules. So it was just enormously popular and had an enormous impact on people's perception of the Chinese. Beyond that, if we move ahead to when the actual year when Fu shows up, when Fu actually shows up in um, Fu actually shows up in the United States, 1898. Well, what's published in 1898? The Yellow Danger, and that's the actual cover that you can see there. Shields Yellow Danger. And uh, Shield's Yellow Danger was basically a series of a compilation and publishing of a serialization of uh, stories he had written about the threat of uh, the what they call the invasion narrative. The idea that China will respond to all the foreign powers taking chunks of China by sort of leading a army out of Asia to attack Europe and the West. And so this book came out and was hugely popular exactly when Fu arrives in America. In addition, just three years earlier, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm had commissioned the famous painting, uh, The Yellow Peril, you know, otherwise known as people of Europe guard your most precious possessions. So this, um, this was the environment Fu was operating in. Now, Going back to William Robinson, the man who would adopt yellow face and become Fu's great rival, he too shows up in Omaha. He is a technical genius and he's working for Leon Herrmann, who's a famous magician, because the magicians from all over America hearing about this Chinese magician who's causing quite such a stir in Omaha, they travel to Omaha to see him. They wanna see what this Chinese magician is doing that is so spectacular. And within Leon Herman's uh, entourage is his technical illusion expert, one William Robinson, 
the man who would become Chung Ling Su. And this is his first meeting, uh, his first experience seeing uh, Ching Ling Fu. Omaha is again important. Uh, another seminal meeting uh, in Omaha takes place between Wu Ting Fang and uh, Ching Ling Fu. Who is Wu Ting Fang? Wu Ting Fang is the powerful ambassador to the US for China. And Wu Ting Fang is a fascinating character. And he is at that time, one of the uh, favored uh, after dinner speakers in America. The illustration you see to the right is from Harper's Weekly, uh, 1900. And it's an illustration of one of the speeches that uh, Wu Ting Fang has given. Wu Ting Fang was fluently bilingual, English and Chinese. He was a legal scholar and had experience in Singapore, mainland China, and Hong Kong. Now, why was Wu Ting Fang in Omaha? Wu Ting Fang was in Omaha at the exposition because President McKinley was in Omaha at the exposition. And President McKinley was in Omaha at the exposition to give a peace, to give a speech on peace at the Peace Jubilee. Because one thing that was happening while the uh, Omaha Exposition was going on was the Spanish-American War. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the Spanish-American War had just ended and the U.S. had won. And what's interesting about the Spanish-American War is it marked the point at which America became a Pacific power. America becomes a Pacific power because because it having defeated Spain in the Spanish-American War, it acquires Guam and it acquires the Philippines. Now, also in this time frame, America acquires Hawaii. So Hawaii was not acquired during the Spanish-American War. There was an insurrection um, that you know, the Dole pineapple plantations were involved in all sorts of shenanigans, and um, the U.S. basically brought Hawaii into the fold and the kingdom became part uh, of the United States. So all this was going on um, at the same time the Omaha Fair was going on, and Wu Ting Fang, what his job was, why he was, why he traveled, he actually officially traveled with President McKinley to the Omaha Exposition, Wu Ting Fang also gave a speech on peace, but his job, his goal was to lobby President McKinley so that the, um, the China Exclusion Act would not apply to the Philippines. Because if the, China, if the China Exclusion Act was extended to this new territory, the Philippines, it would be disastrous for China because China had so much uh, economic trade and other uh, exchanges with the Philippines. It would be disastrous for them. Now, the table is set. All the characters meet in Omaha. Fu's success begins. And the fair comes to an end, uh, November 1st, 1898. And then reflecting um, Fu's enormous popularity in Omaha, he's reluctant to leave Omaha. And Omaha is reluctant to let him go. So he actually stays in Omaha another approximately two weeks. But before he leaves, they rent a theater uh, in Omaha. And there's a grand farewell performance wherein the food troupe is basically saying thank you and goodbye to the people of Omaha. And it was covered intensely uh, throughout the media in Omaha. And it was enormously popular. And um, we have you know, the Omaha World uh, Harold, speaking of the host of friends that Fu uh, had created in his time in Omaha. And uh, what again, this phrase that repeats itself, this wonderful man, Fu was very charismatic, despite the stutter, which is interesting. So the Omaha World's Fair ends, and the question is, what's next for Fu? What's next for Fu is Colonel Hopkins. And people familiar with Elvis and Colonel Parker 
uh, will understand the role that Colonel Hopkins played. Hopkins uh, was the person who ran the largest vaudeville theater chain in the Midwest, so Chicago down to New Orleans, the middle of the country. And um, he recognized uh, he recognized immediately the potential that uh, Fu had to make an enormous amount of money in vaudeville. And uh, what's interesting about this is that is that the initial um, when Fu first left Omaha, they went to New York and they did a performance in New York at a fairly large theater. It was okay, but it was not tremendously successful. What Fu really needed at this point was American management to help him work his way through the U.S. system. So what happened was Hopkins talent agents saw Fu performing and they recognized what it represented as far as potential. They took him uh, Fu troop to Hopkins. Hopkins realized the potential and Hopkins being a booming expert realized that um, part of the booming is signing people to an enormous salary. So he signed Fu to make 1,000 US dollars a week in late in 1898 and the booming began. And at that point in time, promotion was called booming and the entertainment industry was just becoming formalized and these techniques and methodologies were becoming special skills and booming was one of those special skills and Colonel Hopkins was an expert at it. So what we had was Fu being boomed by the experts and having the talent and the act to back it up. What happens next is Fu travels um, from Chicago theaters down through Cincinnati to New Orleans and it's standing room only. Uh, engagements are extended for weeks. He's referred to as his troupe, as the wonders of the century, and there's tremendous success. They continue in this tour and they return back to Chicago in March of 1899. And again, the environment of the entertainment world at that time, you see another uh, sort of disruptive force that's Isadora Duncan. And she is the considered the founder of modern dance. And that's who's performing in Chicago when Fu comes back to Chicago. So there's just this environment of change everywhere. Amidst all this success, Fu's, Fu and his troops' visas expire. So remember, uh, Gage had gotten a special act of con for, uh, Congress for Fu and all the Chinese uh, participating in the World's Fair coming from China. Uh, but those, expi uh, those visas that allowed them to operate in the United States, despite the Exclusion Act, expired. So now you had a situation where the very popular Fu, one of the most popular performers in the U.S., has been arrested at the Great Northern, which have, was one of the major venues in Chicago at the time. So Fu is arrested for overstaying his visa as well as his family members. How is this dealt with in the press? This is very interesting. There's a combination of things going on here, both booming and um, other things. So what happens? Interestingly enough, the first reports appear in the newspapers on April 1st. So people familiar with the significance of April 1st can take a look at these headlines. Um, the emperor wants his magician, called by the emperor. Uh, he wants Ling Fu. So it was presented to the American public, Fu's visa problems. Nothing as mundane as a visa problem. The Chinese emperor wanted his magician back. That's why Fu had to go back. And of course, that was some clever um, booming on the part of Fu's management. But what's interesting is if you go past April 1st, even the New York Times was reporting this was the reason. <laughs> this was the reason Fu was going back, because the emperor wanted him, not because his visa expired. So 
again, of course, the headline wasn't this big under the uh, banner of the New York Times, but it was on the front page and it was down on the left hand corner. So uh, fascinating to see how this was done. But what quickly happened was um, the Hopkins Theater Group, which was like Warner Brothers today, a huge entertainment conglomerate, and a group called Keith's, which handled theaters on the East Coast, were dead set that this enormously profitable act was not going to be taken away from them. So they hired the best entertainment lawyers of the time, and there were entertainment lawyers at that time. The entertainment lawyer um, that was hired was Adolf Marx, who had worked for Barnum and Bailey. And what his job was to do, <clears throat> excuse me, was to challenge the decision made at the administrative level that Fu had to be deported. And you can see here on the right, uh, the Cook County Jail. And that is in fact where the Fu troop, the family, spent the first uh, few days of their deportation trial and their arrest. The other gentleman here is Judge Cecil Colsat, and he would be the judge that the case would be appealed to in Chicago. Now what's interesting is once the court case actually begins, America focuses on the very interesting, authentic legal issues in play. So it's covered much the way, you know, sensational trials are covered today. It was, uh, the wire services were in existence. Every day there would be an update. Uh, the big news was that Chingling Fu was resisting his deportation. Every day the developments would be published. Um, there was a big turn of events when it turned out that Fu's lawyer claimed that Fu was in fact, he didn't need the visa that had been provided by the uh, Special Act of Congress because Fu was in fact an authorized merchant as a partner at the uh, trading firm that he had joined in 1880. And that in fact, Fu had been present in America between 1880 and 1885 working as a partner in that trading firm. And in fact, again, going to the documentation of the trial, Fu's son, Hai Kwai, was uh, ruled to have been born in America during that period and therefore an American citizen, or, and therefore he did not, he could not be deported. But the rest of the family, Fu, his wife, and little Chitai, um, could be deported. So an ama amazing events coming up, different things popping up, and in fact, a link to San Francisco, uh, home of the C CHSA, um, Fu's offices, of course, for the, uh, for the trading company were in San Francisco, and he was granted bail to travel to San Francisco and locate his documentation indicating he was an authorized merchant. And here we go. What was the address? The address where Fu had, the address where Fu had his uh, commercial documents and business offices uh, was in fact 739 Commercial Street in uh, what is, you know, still Chinatown in San Francisco. And isn't it interesting that um, that address now is, um, as of 2019, was a culture center of Taipei Economic Group. And um, that speaks to, I think, a history of title being transferred over the years. And that would in itself be an interesting study, I think, examining the title of that building and how it went through various permutations over the years. But that address, 739 Commercial Street, comes up again and again in uh, San Francisco, Chinese American history, and in Chinese history. A lot of important people had offices there. Now, back to the trial. Uh, turns out that Fu didn't need his uh, authorized merchant certificate, which he was unable to locate, by the way. Uh, the decision, Colsat makes his decision based on the fact that in his interpretation, the Exclusion Act applies only to laborers and that Fu as an artist, therefore uh, the Exclusion Act doesn't apply to him or to the other members of the Fu troop. And Fu can, Fu and the Fu troop can stay in America as long as they want uh, performing because they are artists and not laborers. The general reaction 
to this decision was uh, positive. People liked Fu, they were happy he was able to stay, but there was a significant amount of negative uh, feedback. You see the headline, another loophole made. You see the complaining here about the China Exclusion Act is being so filled so full of holes, resembles a colander. So there was always that tension between uh, those who supported Fu and uh, open to the Chinese and those who were not. Now, what you have is a situation here where Fu is coming off this nationally covered trial and it's like rocket fuel to his popularity. And Keith's, Keith's now, we move on from Hopkins. Hopkins was the theater chain for the Midwest for vaudeville. The most important vaudeville chain, the one that controlled many of the theaters on the East Coast was Keith's theater chain. And they're the ones who now outbid everyone else to get food. And they knew what they had. And they were engaged already in an enormous amount of promotion, promoting Foo, feeding on all the coverage his trial had got. And articles that were coming out before Foo arrived at Keith's declared that Foo was in fact the hit of the decade for vaudeville, even at that point. And he was still cresting, still going up, I should say. So, um, in fact, he was so popular at that time that Keith's, Keith's management decided that he, he should actually premiere in New York, right downtown at their major theater. And he did so. So, Fu ends up premiering in New York for the Keith's chain. And um, again, they, uh, they continue to use in the promotion the idea that the Chinese emperor had tried vainly uh, to force his return to China. Now, Fu's performance in New York, look at the coverage he gets. These are the ads and the coverage he's receiving. His fame only increases. His popularity only increases. He's breaking records all the time. He's, uh, the, the, the gate receipts are record-breaking. The number of people attending are record-breaking. His time at various theaters is extended again and again. Now, here's some of what is being said about Fu in New York. He's the talk of the metropolis. His children, uh, Chitai is the most, Chitai sings both English and Chinese songs. She's considered the cutest thing that ever happened. The most popular, uh, most popular entertainer. The children are the most popular, the most popular youngster that has ever appeared on any stage. It just goes on and on. But at the same time, this is occurring because Fu's so popular, you get a lot of articles coming out trying to explain how he does his tricks. Now, what's interesting is these articles are largely, um, these articles are largely written by magicians who are giving their idea of how they do the tricks. So it's not necessarily how Fu would do the trick. And you see in this one explanation, the, the great crystal bowl, which is what Fu would produce, has got a rubber strap across the top with a shallow level of uh, water in, inside, when in fact foos, uh, the bulls Fu would produce were crystal and full of water and had fish swimming in them. So again, different explanations, uh, different ideas, Fu attracting a lot of attention. Now, one of the things Fu is doing, apart from making a lot of money and attracting a lot of attention, is he's having a real impact on the perception of Chinese in America. Uh, if you look at this uh, image here, a Chinese magician who looks like a statesman, um, there was some really interesting discussion in the newspapers, uh, in the media about Fu uh, as his popularity increased. The discussions were interesting because it became apparent that some of the American journalists weren't quite able to process whether Fu was handsome or not handsome. There seemed to be a bit of a struggle going on. In some reports, he was described as quite striking and handsome. In other reports, he was described as not so much. In fact, in negative terms. And as he went through his tour, uh, gradually the negative voices were won over or overwhelmed by the positive ones. And what you ended up with was this sort of reconfiguration of the narrative 
that uh, Fu was um, a wonderfully charismatic, handsome performer who had accomplished, as you can see in the quotes here, you can take a look at them yourself. Uh, the key idea was he gave, he was giving a very different picture of what, of the Chinese people to the American public. And even to the extent he was compared to Chesterfield, who was the, uh, an Englishman who was the epitome of English grace. And that's quite a compliment coming from America, which at that time was quite sort of uh, in awe on, on a social level. Uh, when they compared themselves to their uh, counterparts in Britain and England. And you see these reports, a man of culture, all these sorts of things. So again, Fu presents a very different picture of the Chinese than had been presented in popular culture up until his arrival. Not only Qingling Fu, it's important to remember his family was very much part of the act. And in fact, that was very much part of the appeal of the Fu Act, as we mentioned earlier, it was a family. And uh, Madame Chingling Fu became quite a celebrity as well. There were a number of articles that had been written about her. And in fact, it's interesting to look at the role of pioneering female journalists and the role they had in writing these stories about the different picture that the Fu family presented. Um, you look at what they're talking about here. They talk about the gracefulness of uh, Mrs. Fu. They, they talked about her assimilation, the fact that she had no difficulty uh, purchasing Western dresses and hats and trying them on and weighing whether she liked them or not. You know, she was for the hats and some of the dresses, but decidedly against the corsets. And um, the, the female pioneering journalists would agree with her on that point. And the other element um, was just of this happy family. Again, if you look at the, uh, the bachelor culture of the, you know, the workers who had come over, uh, the Chinese workers who had toiled and done such great work in so many eras in America, and the bachelor culture that was forced on them by the Page Act and other, uh, other legislation, um, this vision of a Chinese family was something that was not seen in America very frequently. So it was a big part of their appeal and also part of the different picture they presented and the idea that those arguing, and this was a big part of the argument in the China question, that the Chinese were incapable of assimilating, that this simply was not the case when you looked at uh, families such as the Fu family. Now, talking about Fu's impact on, you know, the, the uh, the non-Chinese portion of America's population. What about the Chinese Americans? What about the Chinese living in America at that time? What sort of impact did the Fu Troop and their fame have on them? Generally, they were quite you know, happy with it. You know, it was good to see a positive presentation of the Chinese. Often when Fu would travel to a new city, there would be a dinner hosted for him and he would attend the dinner. Good feelings all around. And it was also part of the promotion uh, you see to your right a letter that uh, Fu had written uh, to a young Chinese boy, the son of a merchant, who was you know, looking forward to see, seeing Fu come perform, in this case, Boston, uh, come and see Fu come and perform in Boston. And you will see this letter actually appeared in English language newspapers with the translation that you see there that he's, you know, Fu is looking forward to coming to Boston to make happy the little boys and girls and do his, do his tricks. And uh, he was very happy to, uh, you know, make this young man happy. What's interesting, of course, was this was yet another promotion trick in that uh, this same letter would appear again and again in various cities uh, to yet another little Chinese boy who had written Fu looking forward to his appearance in their city. Now, so the general public seems to be positively disposed to uh, Fu, the um, Ch Chinese in America positively disposed, and also another important group, the magicians, the American magicians also seem, the fraternity of American conjurers seems warmly disposed towards Fu, mostly. Um, 
Fu well in New York visits Martinka and Company, which is you know like uh, something that would come out of Harry Potter. It's an enormous uh, facility that both sells and manufactures illusions run by Mr. Martinka and his brother. And um, what is important about this institution is what it indicates is how enormous the magic industry was in 1898. Remember, there was no film. There were no movies. People basically entertained themselves or went to the theater. That's why those spoken poems we talked of earlier were so important, why sheet music was so important. So there was an enormous amount of amateur magicians who spent an enormous amount of money uh, on tricks and things like that. At the same time, that stage magic was the premier form of entertainment. The stage magicians were the top stars of the day. Um, Herman, um, Keller, these people were the biggest stars of the day and stage magic was the biggest entertainment that you could have. Now, so Fu, at this point, we're still in New York. Fu in late 1899, people looking, newspapers, media, trying to understand the Fu phenomenon, uh, state that the only person in the United States who might be more popular than Fu at that time is Admiral Dewey. And Admiral Dewey, you see to the left. And Admiral Dewey, who was he? He was the hero of Manila Bay. He's basically the hero of the Spanish-American War. And what happened in Manila Bay was Dewey basically destroyed the Spanish Navy and lost only one serviceman. So he was an enormous hero. Uh, there were newspaper supplements that were put with his photograph, and every good American was to tear out that photograph and put it up in their window. And um, he was they wanted him to run for president. He was just that popular. And so that was the one individual people thought at the time might be more popular than Fu. And on the right, what you see is the um, sheet music for the Chingling Fu rag. Uh, at this point, the popular music at the time was ragtime. And uh, Fu, uh, a song was a, a special rag was uh, created uh, uh, for Ching Ling Fu. Now, again, everything's great. Fu is enormously popular, unprecedented popularity, making an enormous amount of money, making headway in how Chinese are perceived. But be aware, at the same time, Fu is making all this progress. These are the forms of po popular entertainment with Chinese themes that orbit the Fu Act. So the Fu Act would go to a city and then typically one of these uh, entertainments would be orbiting uh, the Fu performance. So if you see New York here in the center, you see that uh, Fu is uh, performing at Hyde and Beams, not too far away at the Bijou Theater, you can see King of the Opium Ring. And of course, you can see um, you can see the uh, illustration for King of the Opium Ring over here on the right. And uh, the, it was obviously the story of opium and Chinese bringing opium into America. And it was described as the black hearted villain, the black hearted Chinese villain at the center of all this elicited um, cat calls from the studio and threats to do the actor harm because he was such a black hearted villain. So those were the presentations that uh, in popular entertainment of the Chinese that were going on at the same time Fu's performances were going on. And of course, here as well over on the left, we have the Queen of Chinatown. What's interesting about that is you see European women. Do you see the poster here? This is an opium den. And you see the European women, you know, uh, passed out from opium or vulnerable from opium. And, you know, the this was the narrative that uh, at the time, the narrative was that uh, Chinese men, it was dangerous for European women to be around them because they were attractive uh, to European women. And there was also this illicit opium element that would uh, you know, be at risk for the, the European women. So again, interesting that these narratives being pushed. And again, just last on this looking here, 
we see another one of these entertainments was French maids in Chinatown. And this was essentially the story of a 16 year old girl who was supposed to be married to an accountant in her sort of mid-sized city. And she didn't want that. So she ran off to the excitement in Chinatown and in New York. And then the father and the, uh, the, the husband-to-be had to chase her down in Chinatown and they too got lost in Chinatown. And interesting thing about Chinatown was, one of the quotes was, people forget who they are in Chinatown. The quote was, they lose their identity. So it was something that people seemed to want to do when they went to this imaginary Chinatown of their minds was to lose their identity. That was part of the appeal of going to Chinatown. So a night, a night, another entertainment night in Chinatown ran for 200 nights. So this Chinese themed entertainment, very popular and generally negative apart from what Fu was doing. Now, another interesting thing that happened in this period was that um, another interesting thing that happened in this period was that uh, some entertainers were a little uh, uneasy with the fact that Fu was the top of the bill. You know, a Chinese performer being at the top of the bill, they were a little uncomfortable with that. Now, one of the stories that relates to that discomfort about Fu's position and his place on the bill is this legendary story of James, the James Thornton incident. What the James Thornton incident was, was a story of what supposedly happened when James Thornton, who was a famous lyricist and uh, he had spoken monologues and he was a singer and songwriter, uh, fairly, you know, very prominent, uh, popular performer. And he told funny stories. And one of the stories he told, funny, was that one day he, you know, one week he was top of the bill in Boston around 1899. And he was top of the bill in Boston. He went to the theater and then he found that his dressing room, lo and behold, had been taken over by Fu. And, um, Whereas he was top of the bill, Fu was under him in the bill, but yet here this presumptuous Chinese man had taken his dressing room. And so according to the story, which you can see on the right, uh, Thornton puts up with this for a, a few days, then he can no longer stand it. And in the great incident that is told over and over again and is supposedly part of Broadway lore, um, Thornton finally can take it no more. And then in the middle of a Fu performance one night, Thornton majestically strides onto stage in the midst of Fu's act, tears off his jacket, rips off his shirt, rolls his shirt up, throws it at Fu, and says, I want it pressed and ready for me Friday morning, to which the crowd erupts supposedly in laughter while Thornton walks majestically off the stage. Hey, amigo mío, escribe este libro. What's that? Yes? Hello? Please meet yourself if you are not a presenter. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. So I, I will continue then? Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, so now this, um, so this incident, this incident became a, you know, a, a, a story that was told again and again and again. And in fact, it appeared in Thornton's obituary in 1938. He was described as a celebrated wit and to describe his celebrated wit, this incident where he threw the shirt at Fu was, um, was described. You see that on the right. What you see on the right is the excerpt from uh, Thornton's obituary published in 1938. And you know, one paragraph after they say he, was, he passed away, they lock into this story. But I will tell you from my research that this never happened and that Fu, um, Fu uh, was a much bigger star than Thornton. And there was never one instance in the entire time that Fu was in his first tour of America that Thornton would ever have been put ahead of Fu on the bill. So it was a great story. It reflected the feelings of the time, but in actuality, it didn't happen, but it sure reflected the feelings at the time and well after that time. 
Okay, so again, we go back now, we're back with technological disruption and Fu as a pioneer in technological uh, new technologies. Fu, um, what does he do in the midst of all this activity? He goes out and in Philadelphia, he records, the makes the first recordings of Chinese music and singing. So reported in the phonograph, you know, reported in the phonograph, that magazine right there, um, Fu created 15 records of Chinese music and singing. Some of those records still exist. So we do have some of these recordings and I am no expert in uh, Peking opera, but uh, some Chinese who are have listened and they say Fu's not very good, <coughs> which is you know not surprising. But what's interesting is they were made at all. And um, not all of the recordings are available now, but some of them are. So again, here we have this uh, another first that Fu has achieved. Now, getting back to the great rivalry between William Robinson, who in yellow face will appear as Cheng Ling Su and uh, Ching Ling Fu, we have a situation where Fu is having this enormous success in New York. William Robinson is not having success. William Robinson wants to be a performer. He wants to be on stage. He's a technical genius, but he has certain problems. His voice is not powerful. He doesn't command the stage. And he, he's struggling with how do, I, how do I get around this? In the meantime, he's studying Fu very closely. He's a technician. He just absorbs everything as Fu is doing. He watches and studies Fu at many, many performances. What, again, another story of magic lore is the beginning of their conflict occurs. The beginning of the conflict between um, Ching Ling Fu and William Robinson occurs when a promotional event, a promotional event, which is um, a promotional tool, I should say, which is a challenge, which is an offer Fu's management makes of a thousand dollars to anyone who can duplicate Fu, uh, Fu's bowl trick. Now, William Robinson as a magician should understand that um, these promotions, these challenges mean absolutely nothing. Uh, but in the story, in the lore, um, supposedly William Robinson takes Fu up on his challenge, shows up at the theater and demonstrates that he can produce the crystal bowl uh, full of water as Fu does and is yet turned away. And it is this being turned away and denied his rightful thousand dollars that sets William Robinson on the path to um, challenging, uh, not only challenging Fu, but creating the act of uh, Cheng Ling Su and moving to London and creating that whole performance. The problem with this story is that nobody, particularly if you were active in the magic field, took these promotional challenges seriously. You couldn't. What you see here is an ad that was in the Mahatma, a magic journal, to send in, I don't know, it might have been $5, $10, and they would send you Ching Ling Fu's bowl trick. By the way, this is not a depiction of Ching Ling Fu. This is a depiction of a magician. So that sort of, uh, that is not meant to be Ching Ling Fu. But what, what I want to do is disavow the idea that, you know, which is in the magic history that somehow uh, Fu in denying uh, William Robinson his rightful $1,000 for demonstrating he could do this illusion uh, was wronged and this put him on the path to challenging uh, Fu. Clearly, anyone who had a certain amount of money could purchase these illusions and magicians in particular were well aware that these challenges were not uh, to be taken seriously. So, January 1900, uh, Fu's exclusive uh, Keith's tour comes to an end, uh, and he is recognized as being a success, having a success that has never been equaled in vaudeville. And the imitators begin to multiply. Uh, this individual, the great Lafayette, is one of the great, uh, one of the great magicians and one of the great uh, 
people who perform what has been called then a travesty. Fu didn't have a problem with Lafayette's travesty or imitation of him. It was respectful and Fu, you know, didn't really uh, see, you know, concern himself too much with it. What's interesting is if you look here, you will see in Lafayette's advertisements, he challenged counterfeiters. He didn't want people to counterfeit his act, yet his whole act was based on imitation. So it's an interesting dynamic there that we'll see again and again with Fu. Fu himself did not seem too concerned about uh, people copying him, but the people who copied him didn't want others to copy their copy. Now, the question you've got to ask at this point is that Fu is surrounded by copycats right now. You have yellow face copycats, you have actual Chinese copycats, they're all over the place. You have different degrees. You have people who belong in a dime store museum, the lowest level. You have sort of mediocre magicians and you have the top level, such as um, Lafayette and William Robinson. And so with all these copycats and all these people performing his act, essentially, he is still making you know, $1,000 to $2,500 a week, plus a percentage of the gate and getting record crowds. Okay. And that is with a situation where most people in the audience have a pretty good idea how that trick is being performed. So this is a really interesting thing about magic. Um, it's not all about the tricks. Uh, the performer and their charisma and their presence and their stagecraft is key. And what you find with Fu is that people come back repeatedly again and again to see his act and his family and the troupe. And the magicians at the time would say, ah, what's happening here? Why is this guy so successful with what we just explained that people you know, have a pretty good idea how the trick is being done? And the answer was, he is some kind of performer. And he was, he had a special charisma, a special skill set, and um, there was a quality of what was called joy in his act. The, you know, the expert critics would look at it and they would say there was a joy in his act that people would go again and again to experience. So quite, quite interesting. And what that also points out that's very important is Fu was not just a race act. The idea that people were going to see an exotic Chinese. That was part of the appeal. But if that's all it was, this endless supply of copycats would have crushed that, at least at this point. We're into two years now. And they didn't. People kept coming to see Fu and they kept repeating their business. And all the major theatrical companies were trying to duplicate Fu. They were all trying to get their own Chinese act, and there were a lot of them. Um, so again, Fu, a very special performer, and very much more than a simple race act. Um, one of his real competitors, someone who potentially could rival Fu appeared, but it wasn't a copycat. It was Harry Houdini. Um, Houdini arrived on uh, December 1899 at a, as a magician way down the bill from Fu. Uh, Fu was on top, of course, lower down on the bill was Houdini. But the very young Houdini, as you can see here, uh, became friends with Fu and they would develop a relationship with, that would last until you know Fu passed away. And Fu, in fact, when he passed away, left a large part of his uh, library on magic to, uh, to Houdini. Now, looking at all the, we're talking about all the competition, all the various forces acting on Fu right now. And um, interestingly, one of the, Fu not only had the copycats, Fu also had to compete against himself. And this is fascinating in that I believe this is likely the first time this ever happened in history that a performer ended up competing with himself. Uh, in film version across the street, literally across the street. If you look at this, you can see that in April of 1900, uh, Fu was performing live. 
at the Bijou. At the same time, right across the street, we're talking, uh, what is it, 30th? And then, uh, you know, right across the street, um, the Comique Theater had a film of Fu performing his tricks that was made by the Lubin Film Company, which was a pioneering film, film company in Philadelphia that had made a uh, film of Fu for commercial purposes that was being shown around the country and in fact, around the world. This film by the Lubin Company of Fu was shipped around the world and it, was, it would be teamed with things like the uh, Boxing World Championship, uh, Corbett Jeffries. Uh, Fu was the undercard. So you would go in Australia and you would see the film of the boxing championship. And then the next film you would see would be Ching Ling Fu doing his tricks. Now I have to add one more thing. Uh, we talked before, and again, since it is San Francisco, uh, the location of the talk. Um, an interesting thing, of course, San Francisco's home of industrial light and magic and Lucas Films. And Lucas Films um, came out of Lucas's work on Star Wars. And Star Wars, if you, according to reports, Star Wars was created by uh, George Lucas when he was unable to obtain the rights to reshoot, refilm the Flash Gordon serial. So he created Star Wars as his uh, Flash Gordon serial. And you can see the similarities and the links, influences. Well, one of the things that fascinated uh, Lucas and others about the Flash Gordon serial were the special effects. And in fact, um, the special effects of that film, those films were considered to be the pioneering uh, special film effects by many. The man who created those special illusions, the film special effects for the Flash Gordon, uh, the Flash Gordon serial was one Jerome Ash. And Jerome Ash um, is linked to Fu because Jerome Ash as a young magician worked for Fu. And when Jerome Ash was touring, promoting the Flash Gordon serial, when he was interviewed and asked what it was like to make these illusions and create these special effects, he would, he would say, you know, working in a warehouse on the studio lot with like 20 workmen and technicians having two weeks to pull these things together is nothing compared to having to do it live in front of an audience of 4,000, which he often had to do with Fu. And so he said, and was quoted as saying, he learned everything he knew about optical illusions from Ching Ling Fu. So there you have, uh, arguably, if, and Jerome Ash is considered the father of film special effects. He worked on many other films, special effects. If Jerome Ash is the father of film special effects, then there's an argument that Fu is then the grandfather. Now, we're winding down all these enormous pressures coming on Fu. He's not only has all the competition, he's also having contractual problems with his management. He's making a lot of money, but he feels that um, he's not getting an appropriate share of the amount of money he's getting, nor is he happy with uh, how Keith's and uh, uh, EF Albee is dealing with him. So we're in Washington in January 1900, and Fu is the costliest vaudeville act in the world and well performing in Washington. We have Wu Ting Fang reappear, the ambassador, the Chinese ambassador in Washington. And he's been watching what's going on and the tremendous impact that Fu has had. <clears throat> so what happens at, um, just one second, I'm gonna get the tea here. What happens is that, um, he arranges, Wu Ting Fang arranges for Ching Ling Fu to receive an imperial flag for the work he's doing improving US and China relations. So the flag is presented to Fu uh, on the stage in Washington by representatives of the Chinese legation with Wu Ting Fang in the audience. Now, 
What people don't know at that point in time is that while he's in Washington, while he is in Washington, uh, Fu meets uh, with Wu Ting Fang. And the purpose of the meeting is to convey to Wu Ting Fang his Fu's disappointment with what's happening with his contract and all the difficulties and things he's having, problems he's having with his management and Keith's management. And amazingly, uh, what happens is that Wu Ting Fang acts as the mediator, the ambassador, the Chinese ambassador to Washington, acts as the mediator for discussions between Fu and Alby, E.F. Alby, the head of Keith's theater, who travels to Washington to meet with uh, Wu Ting Fang and Fu to discuss contractual issues. And um, I provide here, here, here is the uh, Chinese embassy in Washington in 1900. Oops, we just, excuse me, I'll have to get back to that. That is basically the, would be the residence and embassy for Wu Ting Fang at that time. And I will scroll back and get that. But uh, the other building in that image is the hotel where Fu was staying. One second. There we go. So this is the Riggs Hotel, an exceptionally luxurious hotel where the Fu troop was staying. And they would meet there and at the Chinese embassy uh, in Washington. Now, although these contractual uh, problems seem to have been resolved, uh, it appears that um, they weren't entirely resolved. E.F. Albee, uh, E.F. Albee basically um, decides if he's, you know, he's going to be giving Fu more, bigger share of the money to work him even harder. And so you end up with a situation, Fu returns uh, to New York um, and is in fact pulling double duty because he's performing in vaudeville uh, in the afternoon on a double bill. So he does the afternoon shows at the Bijou. And then in the evenings, he has to perform or is contractually obligated to perform in a Broadway musical uh, in the evening, a Broadway musical called Broadway to Tokyo. So Fu, you know, as tired as he is getting into these two years of on the road, now has to split his time every day between uh, a Broadway musical in the evening and a uh, performances of his show in the afternoon. On top of that, the tour that they had planned to go into Canada had to be canceled after it was all set up and promoted because immigration authorities uh, on the American side and the Canadian side could not agree on terms that would enable Fu to enter Canada, perform in Canada, and then safely return to the United States. So things were piling up. January 1900 to April 1900, peak Fu had crested and things were coming apart. What happens is a tired Fu ignores offers to tour Europe and Australia and returns home to China. And with Fu gone, uh, William Robinson steps into the breach. All those people in Europe clamoring, theater managers for a Chingling Fu act, will now get uh, William Robinson in yellow face, who will perform as Chungling Su. And the reason it works so well for Robinson is many of the elements of Fu's act, uh, not speaking, working through an interpreter, mask various performance flaws that Robinson has. So Robinson heads off to London as Chung Ling Su. Now poor Fu, Fu returns to China and walks into the Boxer Rebellion. He hopes, um, he walks right into the middle of the Boxer Rebellion. He's, um, Maggie, how am I doing time-wise here? Uh, there's about five minutes left of what we okay. did before. Okay. Uh, okay. But if you need to go a little bit longer, that's okay too. Okay, I'll, I'll move through this quickly. Like I said, <laughs> I'm going to focus on the first part of his tour here. But um, I'll, I'll go through this a bit rapidly. Um, so Fu, Fu being from Tianjin, returns to China and walks into the middle of the Boxer Rebellion. 
Now, what's interesting about this is Foo is so famous in the US right now that um, in cartoons, editorial cartoons about the uh, Boxer Rebellion, he actually is used to represent China. So if you look at on the right here, you have Uncle Sam and uh, representing America, of course, and then you have um, Fu representing China. And you know, so it's quite remarkable the impact that uh, Fu has had on the American imagination. The other thing that's interesting about this is America learning about the Boxer Rebellion. One of their one of the things that newspapers are primarily interested about is what's happened to Fu. So you see all these headlines during the Boxer Rebellion about Fu. You know, is Fu okay? What's happened to Fu? What's happened to his family? And there's E.F. Albee shares letters from Fu, and they're big stories each time one comes out. Now, as I said, I'm gonna. We were going to focus on the first tour in this talk. I'll just touch on very rapidly a few elements that come after the first tour. Um, you see here a lovely postcard. Uh, Fu took about three years to get you know back on his feet, both from physical injuries and uh, financial problems that had occurred as part of the Boxer Rebellion. You see here a wonderful postcard that had come into the hands of Houdini. That's Houdini's scribblings on the back. And what you have, um, what you have there is Fu's signature, uh, Julian Kui, um, not his Chingling Fu signature. This is like a personal postcard to a friend, Julian Kui. And then the second uh, uh, set of characters here uh, basically uh, translates roughly, uh, gather all the treasure. So basically, it's a sort of an in-joke between magicians, performers, to, you know, make sure they get all the money from the theater performances. And that, of course, was Chitoy with him on the side there. So again, rapidly, uh, Chung Ling Su is making a fortune in London. And then you have what is considered the uh, world championship of Chinese magic when Fu has no choice and he has to go to London because he cannot go to America because of tightening immigration laws and runs into uh, Chung Ling Su, who in the years intervening between 1900 and 1905, has become one of the most popular performers in Europe and one of the most popular performers in London, performing in yellow face as uh, Chung Ling Su. Thus begins the war between the rival wizards. And uh, as I say, I'll try to wrap this up so there's questions. The um, fact that uh, after initiating this contest, Fu doesn't show up for the actual contest. And the reason that I posit in my book that everyone puzzles over is that Fu was always in contact with the Chinese legation. The idea was that Su, even though he was in yellow face, even though he was you know, sometimes a bit off in his presentation, it was generally a positive presentation and there was nothing to gain from Fu destroying Su from the perspective of you know, positive image of the Chinese. And Fu, uh, being a good soldier, decided not to bring Su down. And in fact, the fact he never said anything about this after, despite the fact he could have very easily taken Su down on not being Chinese and have stolen his act, points to some very strong arguments having been made. Then, the last thing we'll talk about, technical, disru uh, technical disruption and new technologies. Fu also made Wu Chang Uprising, which was China's first film documentary. And not only was it the first one, it had a pivotal role in supporting uh, the Republican forces as and the fall of the Qing dynasty. So quite a remarkable, uh, that would have been enough in anybody's life. He made uh, the first Chinese film documentary and it played a key role in the fall of the Qing dynasty. And that was recognized in 2011 when uh, Julian Kui was honored as the father of Chinese documentary film. As I said, another time we'll talk about the second tour and uh, 1912, 1915 as successful or more than the first tour, remarkable 10 years after. And his partnership with Burt Williams, who was the high, one of the highest paid stars of the Ziegfeld Follies and an amazing uh, black performer in a period where it was also very difficult for black performers. 
Fu was also a major a pioneer in celebrity endorsements, cars and hats. March 1918, Sue dies on stage. Of course, they mistake him for Fu. Then Fu dies in 1922. What was Fu's greatest legacy? In America and North America, it was probably his presenting a different picture of the Chinese. And here Fu is with Chi Toi Okito and Houdini and his wife. And sorry for the rush, but uh, there you go, Maggie. Oh, wait, you're spotlighted. Okay, hey, thank you, Samuel. And I guess to point out, it is like 5 a.m. or 4.30 in Shanghai. So um, that's yeah, why you hear you. the birds. You can hear yeah, some that's why birds. you hear the birds. Those thank you so birds. much for, you know, for being awake for us. And, it, you know, you were very wanting to go and show this to our community and tell more about Chinlin Fu. So we really appreciate, like, you staying up late and doing this. I can tell that it's tiring, but um, great no performance. Or not performance, it's a great presentation. We have okay. lots of questions, so we're going to, you Excellent. know, get through as many as we can. And I've combined some of them because some people had similar questions. Gotcha. Um, so the first question. Should I stop from, screen sharing? Should uh, I stop? Yeah, we can. Yeah, let's stop screen sharing. There was one question about one of the images on the screen, but um, we okay. can come to that later. Okay, well, I'll keep um, it on then. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so the first question actually comes from your sister, and Nancy okay. also asked the same question. Uh -huh. They want to know how you got interested in Chinlin Fu's history um, <laughs> and why you started your research. Well, thanks, sis and Nancy. Um, coming in from Canada, I imagine. I, I would say that um, it began, the, the, I work as an artist and uh, illustrator in, uh, and writer uh, in China. Uh, and one of the themes of the artwork that I've done, a recurring theme, is China in the Western imagination. Uh, I'm looking at how the West processes China in popular culture, particularly from the gold rush era, modern China. And in going through that and looking at the various you know, popular culture and how the West processes China, um, I came across invariably uh, Cheng Ling Su. Having come across Chun Ling Su, I then came across Fu as sort of a secondary actor in the romantic tale of Chung, you know, Chun Ling Su. And as I began to research uh, Fu, you know, the, the original Chinese conjurer, I just uh, found more and more uh, what a fascinating character this was, how forgotten he was, everything that he had achieved. And um, it just, it was all, a lot of it was original research. Nobody in China, in uh, North America, people were not aware of the amazing variety of things this man had achieved. So that's yeah. what happened. And uh, so usually though, you've done like kind of research before, but you usually do graphic novels. Um, that's this right. was the like, first time you did a novel. Well, itself. this is the first time I did a biography. In fact, that's, that's an interesting point. Yeah, I've, I've had like, uh, I've, done a, I've done a couple of graphic novels and I'm not gonna do any more after I finish this first series that uh, Constable Kong's Mysteries of Old Shanghai because as, 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 a, as an artist and illustrator, I find it's, it's incredibly difficult because sequential panel telling, I want each panel to be perfect. And you can't really do that if you wanna you know, really churn out the graphic novels. So, uh, and, and this goes directly to your question. Originally, when I looked at the Fu story, I thought, okay, this would make a great graphic novel. But as I began to work on the graphic novel, and you've seen some of the illustrations that were used for this presentation, uh, I found that it would be impossible for me. I found, you know, to do justice to the artwork. So what I decided was that it was easier to write a 500 page biography with 850 endnotes than it was to do a graphic novel. And in fact, it was. I, fit, I, you know, I would still be working on that graphic novel if, if, if I had folks. But I am going to do, you know, I am doing artwork related to Foo, but I'm not doing a graphic novel. So yes. Okay. And I guess it's good to point, like, point out, like, this is only, you spoke for an hour and a half, and you only are focusing on what small parts are like part of the novel that you wrote. Well, the, the um, biography, the research yeah. that you've done, yeah, yeah biography, yeah. novels, yeah. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah, it's <laughs> biography. a biography, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, I focused, yeah, the Fu, other elements, like we touched upon most of them, but what I left out here was his second tour, 
And uh, the second tour is as interesting as the first and, you know, as important in many ways. And there was, you know, he was just as successful, which is remarkable because it's more than 10 years later. And to step out of an entertainment field and then come back 10 years later and come back as number one, it's remarkable. And there's all sorts of storylines in the second tour. Like he destroyed, he, he helped destroy the UBO monopoly, the United Booking Office monopoly, by refusing to you know, follow their orders about how much he would be paid and where he would perform. Um, he, you know, there was the, you know, this whole destruction of vaudeville by film. When Fu left in 1915 after, you know, California, what was he competing with? Listen to this. He was competing. Charlie Chaplin was just emerging. In fact, he was called Charles because he hadn't become Charlie Chaplin yet. But what was the movie? It's fascinating. The movie that was playing and competing against Fu in California was The Klansman, which would, of course, become Birth of a Nation, you know, which is a whole other. But this whole push and pull between, you know, diversity and acceptance and pushing back that goes throughout his career. It's fascinating. So, yeah, we didn't get into the second tour. But, um, you know, that is in the book, that is in the biography, and some of the women, some of the amazing women in his, you know, when he, he toured with during the second tour, also incredibly fascinating. All right. I'm going to ask the question about um, what someone had asked something about the screen right now, and then we can mm. do the stop share screen. The question was from uh, Gian. They, yeah. uh, they asked, why was Fu called the Megolian Man on the advertisement? I believe that was screen like two or three. It was right at the beginning. Okay, well, that would have been... That would have been probably an advertisement and it would have been an advertisement and they, they just conflated everybody. They mixed everybody. If you're from Asia, you know, he would be considered, you know, oh, we can also call him as if he's from Mongolia. So can you bring that screen back up by chance? I don't know which be? one it is. I'm not okay. sure which one it is, but basically it's an advertisement. In the advertisement, they would, um, in the advertisement, they would say, um, you know, any number of things, right? He was also known as the Wizard of the North because he, you know, he did come from Tianjin and things like that. But the reason they said Mongolian is just that, you know, that's the way they would talk in America at that time. They wouldn't see any difference. They saw Chinese, Mongolian, same thing. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, again, about like your book comes from mm -hmm. multiple people asking if you're working on a movie uh, about Chin Lin okay. Well, of course, you know, of course we're working on a movie. Everyone's working on a movie. We, um, we have like, we do have a screenplay. We have a working screenplay. We've actually had discussions, serious discussions with two production companies, but anybody who's familiar with the film world knows that means absolutely nothing. We haven't signed an option purchase agreement yet. Um, and, and even if we did, uh, there's one chance out of a hundred, you know, every, anything would ultimately come forward. But we are, uh, we do have a documentary we have signed an agreement with a really good documentary company and they're going to be, um, you know, they're doing the preparation work now. So that I think certainly the documentary is in the works. Uh, we would love to see a, we think it would be excellent for a streaming series and we, you know, we'll see what happens. Okay. Um, next question comes from Ben and he's actually going to turn on his camera and ask you directly. Okay. He has a couple questions. Okay. Ben, if we could have you... Turn on your camera. Hey, Ben. Oh, we hey, have two Ben. Uh, ben G. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Sam, thank you so much. That was an awesome lecture. Uh, uh, really appreciate it. I'm after this. I'm going to run out and buy the book. Good. I mean, it was so great. And I'm a, I'm a, a magic aficionado oh, as well. And uh, a member of the Magic Castle. Oh, and so this this Bill is Goodwin, kind of a double. Bill Goodwin and Jim Steinmeier were so much help for me. Oh, yes, yes, the librarian yeah. at Magic Castle and Jim Steinmeier. Oh, great people, fantastic. Yes. Yeah, absolutely right. So I have two questions. Um, one is I would be interested to know what happened to uh, to Mister Fu at the oh. end. You, you obviously he dies. Something happens to him. And I'd be interested to know what happened to his family and if they carried on any of the traditions of magic. And then okay. um, the other question I would have is, um, in light of everything going on in, in, uh, in the world today, are there any, do you see any lessons from uh, Chingling Fu as applied to what's going on now? 
Yeah. Can I start with the last question first, then go back? Sure. Okay, because that just struck me. Um, y you know what, in going through the talk and, and preparing the talk, because of course I'd written that long biography and then I had to condense it down. What, what struck me, you know, going over the material again was that you know, it had looked the tension, right? It's not always perfect, right? It's never 100% sunshine and it's never 100% darkness. Here you have a situation where you have the China Exclusion Act, it, horrible xenophobia and racism directed towards Chinese and Asians. And at the same time, you have this guy who's the most popular performer in America, who's <laughs> Chinese, right? And it's, and you know, the social 400 in New York are trying to, and he's this wonderful man. And I think, and, and, but, and he's terribly, but at the same time, you've got, you know, uh, Queen of Chinatown, right? You have this wonderful, you know, all these things exist together, right? And I think the idea is that it's never as bad as we think it is, and it's never as good, right? So even though it seems like it's, you know, tough times right now, uh, on, and, and I'm thinking tough times for people-to-people -people diplomacy, because it seems like there's so much toxicity now attached to the relationship on both sides, right? That there's this hostility, and that even people-to-people -people diplomacy or cultural diplomacy is something that's going to get dragooned into, you know, the punch-up. And I think that ideally it won't, and that the lesson, the lesson I take from it is people-to-people -people diplomacy is key, and it does have an impact, and that it is important, and cultural diplomacy and people-to-people, -people, I think, is something that has to continue, and um, I, that's what I take from it. And if I could go to your other questions, what happened to food? This is the great, you know, sorrow of biography and research, and, you know, I know he died in 1922, I know there was, he came back from, uh, you know, his second tour. He had a wonderful vacation. He had a wonderful vacation with, um, he had a wonderful vacation with uh, Keller, the magician. I don't know if you're familiar. Like he spent yep. two weeks with his family traveling around in Harry's big car, showing them all around California. It was a wonderful vacation. They went back. You know, he went into semi-retirement. There were financial difficulties. Um, one of his theaters burned down. Uh, his mansion burned down in Shanghai. Um, you know, he, 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 he was ill. Uh, Su showed up. This for magic aficionado. You know, Chung Ling Su actually showed up during World War II in Shanghai. But, you know, it was so anticlimactic because it was so, everyone was focused on the war. Sue, uh, Robinson couldn't even get a decent theater in Shanghai to, you know, do, stage his act because all the good theaters were used for raising money for the war. So, you know, it was just a dim, dismal time. And he basically, he, you know, he, he passed away in 1922. But I think having recognized like what, you know, what he had achieved and had a very good life and his family, you say, uh, that's a, you know, read the book on his family, right? I don't want to go into too much detail on that, but that is a complicated question. Who in fact was his family, mm -hmm. right? And um, that, uh, and that colors the other element, like did they carry on the act? Because there were various actors who carried on the act and that in and of itself is a whole other dis talk or discussion, what happened after that. And in fact, I'm working on a very slim book this time on the uh, on that very issue right now. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, thanks. Thanks very much, Ben. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Um, ben W. also had a similar question, so we got both of your okay. guys' questions at the same time. Okay. Uh, next question comes from Frank. Um, he wants to know if Fu was able to stay in white areas of the segregated hotels and cities. Excellent question. Excellent question. This is what's so fascinating when you, you do the research and you're actually doing the original research. You're not listening to what you know people say or what's going on. One point I'll raise on that is early on during the Omaha Exposition, when, um, when Fu, uh, when the Chinese arrived, um, uh, they were greeted by the local Chinese, right? And then when one of the Chinese uh, in the performing group died, there was a Chinese funeral. Again, uh, local Chinese from all over attended. And one of the interesting things was comments in the newspapers, like in reports, the original archives I was looking at, the reporters were stunned and shocked 
that so many of the Chinese men, local Chinese men appearing at the funeral were accompanied by their white wives, right? So this again, like this idea, and, and then the Fu troop, the, you know, this, they, 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 they sort of, in many instances, they, they, in the West, they, uh, in Omaha, they, 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 it was seamless, the movement that they had. Um, they, uh, and then later in the second tour, there was, there was a couple of interesting incidents though. One uh, with hotels. So uh, being Chinese, they enjoyed making their own food because the food in America at that time wasn't quite, you know, what a, a Chinese palate would, would find uh, desirable. So they tended to have their own cook and travel with their own cook. And when they would check into a hotel, they would basically want to cook in their rooms. And when they went to Boston, there was a big, a big to-do because I think it was the Copley Hotel, the new luxury hotel had just opened. And, and again, it was like the Thornton incident, like this presumption, right? This sort of native triumph. Um, you know, Fu comes in and he says, look, we want to check in. We're going to do this and we're going to have, we're going to have a separate room for a kitchen and make, and the Copley said, none of that at the Copley Luxury Hotel. You know, if you want to be making food in your room, best off to Chinatown to do that, right? And the interesting thing was the coverage was very triumphal that, oh, you know, here comes Fu trying to, and we told him, no, 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 off you go to uh, Chinatown for that. And then also in Los Angeles, when they were in Los Angeles, interestingly enough, Los Angeles and New Orleans seemed to be the places where there was the most unease about mm -hmm. that sort of mixing. And um, in the Los Angeles, in the second tour, uh, there was concern because food, they had rented this wonderful apartment in, in what was called, um, I forget, it was like Neon Way or something. It was like the, the Hollywood area of, uh, of the Los Angeles side. And um, they, they hosted these night, these parties all the time, these midnight dinners. And they would have like midnight dinners, Chinese dinners up on the roof and everybody from Hollywood and the entertainment business would come. But the newspapers were quite uh, sort of interested that Fu was staying in these, you know, uh, these, you know, first class hotels. And in fact, using these apartments that would, you know, they thought, well, he's not in Chinatown. And so the papers were remarking that, gee, he's not in Chinatown, but there seemed no, uh, you know, enforcement of any sort of the fact he had to be there. Interesting. Yeah. So it kind of like depended on where he was going to be at. And then like, the, you know, you're saying the Midwest. More, oh, yeah. And yes, I think, and yeah. again, not much has changed, right? It very much depends where you are. Like, you know, in any country, what, what happens and what doesn't happen, right? Okay. So next question um, is about the, how much money he was making. It comes mm. from Robert. Um, mm -hmm. What is the 1000 to 2500 in today's dollars? Do you remember okay. what that is? Those, those calculators are always, you know, a bit off. But what, what you will get if you use those calculations, 1898, but 1000 bucks is going to be about 35000 US a week, right? So, and then like 2500 you're going to be in the 1912, 1915, is going to be about 56, uh, 60,000 US a week. But remember, he was also getting a percentage of the gate. So, you know, that's like when the executive says his salary is, you know, 100,000 a year, but he's also getting shares and all this other stuff. So those theaters, you've got to understand too, those theaters um, held up to 4,000 people, you know? So a, a portion of the gate would have been something. And that's why there was this huge struggle between mm -hmm. Keith Theater and Fu about, you know, how much am I getting to that? So was yeah. that was standard a then money, that, that a performer would get so much from the gate? At, uh, uh, you could negotiate depending on, you know, it's like, it's like today, if, if you're the really, you know, the movie stars that get a percentage of ticket sales, right? The upfront, if you're big enough star, you can negotiate that just as in that time, if you're a big enough star, you can negotiate that. But Fu's salary was way above. So, you know, you're looking at very, very few performers who are making like Houdini, for example, like when in, in the first tour, when they were in Buffalo, Houdini was making 150 a week while mm -hmm. Fu was making like 1500 or something. So, you know, he, it, it was, but it was also good for booming, right? You know, you'd say, I got to go see this guy. He's making 2,500 a week, you know, yeah. what's he doing, <laughs> right? So yeah, it, it had a big, it was part of the booming. So um, another question from Han, uh, Han Lao is, did you look into the archives in Chinese language to learn about Shen Fu? 
unfortunately. Yes, yes. I looked into the Chinese archives at the Shanghai Library um, and any other place where there you know, was any sort of record. And this, the reality is, um, anyone doing archival research in China will tell you, um, the, you know, apart from a number of different sources, the, you know, a lot of stuff has been lost, right? So, but there is, there are, um, there are, uh, China, or, you want original information, right? If you're talking about original information and archival information, where a lot of that information comes is actually in the archives in the U.S., things like the actual court case documentation, immigration documents, all that sort of stuff. In China, what you have is some contemporaneous uh, reporting and newspaper publishing. So you can get like Chinese newspapers and what they were writing about Fu at the time. For example, there was a lot of material on Wu Chang uprising, you know, the documentary he had made that helped bring down the Qing dynasty. You know, there was, you know, reports of like, you know, where it was showing, you know, what, what theaters it was at, the reaction, the reviews to that film. Um, there is some, uh, what you find later on, though, once Fu is passed and into the modern era, largely what you see in Chinese language right now reflects what was written in English about Fu, uh, you know, before. So it's a loop, right? What, absent that original archival stuff, what you have is a loop of people in China reading about Fu from English language sources and then translating what they read into Chinese, which often is not correct. Mm, so okay. you really have to go back to the original archival information, some of it Chinese, some of it um, English, um, to really determine what is what, because you know, what you've got is sort of a feedback loop where people are repeating stuff that is basically just translated from the English reports that were not originally correct anyway. Okay, thank you. Our next question is going to come from Edith, and she's going to ask the question live. Edith? Edith. Okay. Hi. Hi, Edith. Okay, actually, I have three questions, so bear with me. First, as so many viewers have expressed in the chat, the, your presentation is absolutely fascinating. Just want to oh, say that. that I was hoping question. it wasn't going on long and boring. Oh, so it was fascinating. Okay. So, as you said at the beginning of your presentation, the yeah. story of Fu is so much more than just the tale of an entertainer and a musician. It's mm. so much bigger in the context of Chinese American history. But yes. I was wondering if Fu himself has actually, or family members expressed insight or um, anything about their experiences themselves. So this, is, this is like, I've written the book, I've put the biography out there. We've been unable to locate any sort of relevance. And the thing is, and as you know, that, that the, the, what China went through over, like, you know, imagine 1920, you know, 1922 Fu dies, right? What happens in China? Like from the time he went back for that matter, from 1915 to 1922, and then up through 1979, everything that was going on in China, you know, and where did his family end up? We don't know. We have, I have some research on some members and we've done census data and everything. So we've checked the census data in the US. We've done uh, the University of Texas at Austin. If Eric is listening, hello. He's, he's, you know, he's, he's been helping with that. But, and we do know some interesting things about you know, some people who might've been in the US in the 1930s and stuff like that, but whether they ended up being back in, uh, whether they ended up being back in China or staying in the US, we don't know. Uh, his, his family, like, there's indications his family was, obviously he was in the film business, you know, he was smart enough to recognize vaudeville's dying film is the way, and his son was involved in that, and his son actually purchased um, films for uh, the Asian market, you know, Hollywood films and things like that, and there were like gossip columns that would say, you know, oh, saw so-and-so today, the, you know, the son of you know, Ching Ling Fu, and he's, you know, negotiating a new deal to do this, but then you can't find them, right? You don't know what happened. So ideally, you know, someone out there uh, has some idea or some knowledge of what happened to these people. So are there any films of Fu's performances? Okay. The, again, this is the tragedy of film uh, and, and chemistry. The, uh, you know, the films that were made at that time were beautiful, like, you know, the silver nitrate and all that other stuff. They, they're enormously detailed and beautiful. 
And um, the, the films of Fu performing his tricks by Lubin, apparently the ones that competed with the live Fu were incredibly detailed and great, but we have no record of them now. And mm -hmm. Fu, the fire, the fire that occurred, the fire that occurred at Fu's mansion in Shanghai uh, probably was started by film. You know, the chemicals and the nitrates and things like that, that destroyed, Fu had, Fu had, Fu had a cinematographer with him. Even in 1904, Fu had an actual Chinese cinematographer with him. And in 1904, there are reports that he had 8,000 feet of film of China and that he, part of his act was integrating the film with his performance, you know? And it seems a bit odd today, but Wuchang Uprising was part of his act. So you can imagine you'd be like a variety act and in the midst of it, you're a war documentary, but uh, you know, it, it served its purpose. But um, the one thing we have is um, Wuchang Uprising, that documentary that he made, although there's no, it, it, it doesn't exist as it was made now, um, people believe segments <coughs> and clips from that film were used in later films that they've identified as likely coming from Wuchang Uprising. And there was even a commemorative set of stamps of heroes of the revolution that were made in China, Sun Yat-sen and others, that took stills from that. Uh, so, th that, so those stamps, if you find those stamps, those are drawn from Fu's documentary. <coughs> Excuse me. And then my last question is, during your writing process, yeah. did you yourself have any revelations or perhaps changing in what your writing would be about? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I started, I started this, as I said, as a graphic novel, and I was just going to focus on Fu versus Su, right? That big, you know, uh, world champions of Chinese magic. But then as I began to research and, you know, sort of peel back the onion on this guy's life. And then I looked at the, you know, the original archival research and you look at, you know, how can people not know this? How is this guy, you know, how can both Chinese audiences and Western audiences, you know, barely know who this guy is, right? And, you know, even if they don't know who he is, at least there should be some place where it's written down that this is what he did, right? Mm -hmm. Even if nobody's interested. But uh, <clears throat> that's what, that was the, and looking at his life and just, um, uh, just endless, how can one man do so many different things? And the other thing that struck me is how good natured he was, right? I thought it wouldn't have been great to have known him because, you know, you get a sort of sense by osmosis of the guy's personality, like that gather all the treasure, you know? And so here was a guy who could walk into any environment practically who had a stutter, right? He had a stutter and he was a businessman and a magician. So he used that magic to create relationships and do things like that. But, um, you know, it seemed to me he would have been a fascinating guy. And Harry Keller says it, right? He says he's a prince, you know, prince and a gentleman. And, uh, hmm. you know, yeah, it would have been great. I think it would be very fascinating to get to know him, see what he was like. Well, thank you. My last comment, Maggie, I just want to squeeze that in to Maggie yeah. and those CHS uh, yeah. aid program organizers and Sam. Wouldn't it be great for all of us to see Act Two of Foo's life? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, please. Yeah. yeah, if you haven't seen, please fill out our survey. Um, if you guys are interested in like learning more about part two. Um, we would love to have Sam back if that's, you know, everyone feels strongly about that. But I can pass that on. Okay, um, thank you. Head office, I guess. But yes, thank you. Um, we're mm -hmm. right at you know 2 p.m. Pacific time. But if I could ask you one more question, Sam, um, we yep. focus a lot about Chinese history, but there was a question about what are some of his most famous magic or illusionist acts or tricks. Yeah, he he was. If you go through magic history, you'll see there's an enormous amount of uh, tricks that are are attributed to Ching Ling Fu. Some of which he didn't do or didn't originate. But um, there are Fu cones, you know, lifting up cones and things appearing from under them. His key thing was the uh, production trick where he would lay down his shawl, pull it up. Those are all described in the book. Um, you can see in detail. So his production tricks were the key thing, like where he would very rapidly lift up a shawl and there'd be even like two small toddlers or like a bowl of huge bowl of uh, water, 60 gallons with ducks swimming around in it and fish and everything. And then there was the fire breathing, 
and the emitting of this you know, fragrant, thick smoke that would envelop the whole uh, entertainment area. And there was that food, one thing that's very characteristic was the, the paper tearing that is known as the food. He would tear paper and then put it back together again. Um, he did a thing with swallows and birds. So you would, you, the birds would, you know, he would have the birds fly at his command around this, the audience and they would come to him at his command and they would pretend to lie down and die at his command. Then they would get up again and fly again. Uh, he made paper frogs into real frogs. He, he had a variety of things, but one of the things he, he you know, Jim Steinmeier and I had a dis couple of discussions about this, Jim Steinmeier, the author of Glorious Deception and, you know, one of the great uh, magic uh, technicians, illusionist uh, designer in the world. Uh, the question of whether, um, the question of whether uh, Fu invented this water production trick, because you'll look at advertisements in the 1930s for water companies, 1920s, 1930s advertisement for water utility companies. And they'll have uh, an illustration of Fu making water come out of nowhere. And they'll say something about, you know, Ching Ling Fu did this, but maybe you want to do that. You know, that was the ad. But um, that was actually more of a Japanese trick. But Fu shared the stage with Japanese magicians and he may have adopted that trick later. But that was a trick, one of these tricks that was, you know, it became associated with Fu that uh, doesn't appear to have been, you know, originated by Fu. All right. Well, thank you so much, Samuel. Thank you for staying up with us, sharing mm -hmm. the story of Chinlin Fu part one with the CHSA audiences. Hopefully yeah. we can have you back for part two. And thank you everyone again for joining today. Um, you know, we're really excited to be able to bring this history to our audiences and community. Any last thoughts before we sign off? No, it's just the birds are chirping. It's, uh, <laughs> well, morning. good night to you. Okay. Good morning for everyone else. And we will, you know, talk to everyone later. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Maggie. Thanks everybody at CHSA for helping me with this. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.